<laughs> wow. Wow. Golly. Okay, that's enough. Thank you. But I loved it. Let's keep going. No, no. Um, you guys have always been so incredibly honoring, and you're actually going to make me cry when I start off this service. But, man, thank you for saying that. I'm, I'm so humbled and honored. I love you, Chase Oaks. And it is so wonderful to be back. I, I've missed you. And so thank you for your warm welcome. Um, I, let's do something really fast. I want to welcome everybody that's online, all, all the campuses. Thank you so much for joining us. It's wonderful to have you. Hey, Legacy, I want you to let everybody that's online, uh, that's on vacation, they're at their summer house, right? Let, let them know how much you love them by getting a little bit rowdy. We love you. We're glad that you're with us today. No matter where you're at. It's great to have you. So for those that don't know me, you're new here. My name is Blake Bergstrom, and I used to be the teaching pastor here. But the Lord called me away uh, to go uh, actually lead a church and became a lead pastor. And so it's just south of Atlanta in a little town called Peachtree City. It's a dreamy little town with 100 miles of golf cart paths. And so it's a, it's a really fun place. You're more than welcome to come visit and hang out with me and play golf, okay? I, and some of you have done that. You've kept in touch with me and watched my sermons even and been so kind. And I'm just so grateful uh, for the impact that you have on me. This is what I say about you. Um, I had been through a lot of pretty hard church uh, hurt, uh, church after church after church, and my time here at Chase Oaks was actually what restored my heart to go back into full-time vocational ministry, and Pastor Jeff was pivotal in, in that. Um, I'll never forget a phone call that I felt like he was directed by the Holy Spirit, and he picks up the phone, and he says, Blake, I've been praying about you, and I, I feel like it's time for you to lead a church. And he, he said, your heart for people and your heart for the kingdom is beautiful and, and the church is better if you're leading it. And so that was like, I felt like I heard from the Lord in that. And so that was very key in, in like helping me get started in, in this venture. And I can't wait to tell you more about it. But before I do that, was it okay if I update you a little bit on my family, what's going on with them? Okay. So for those of you that don't know me, I have four daughters, Madison, Mariah, Montana, and Mercy. And they're all beautiful little blonde head girls. But three of them have been married in the past two years. Yeah. yeah. So I, I am broke as a joke. There's no money left, right? Uh, but praise God, my daughter Madison finally brought me my first grandbaby. And so her name, yeah. I got a picture of her. She's got these awesome blue eyes. Her name is Elizabeth Blake. We call her Ellie Blake, and she calls me Bam Bam, which is very fitting if you know me. Um, my daughter Madison is also pregnant with her second, and it's due in October. My daughter Montana is pregnant with her first, and she's actually due in December. So by the new year, I will have three grandbabies. Now, before you say anything, they are all girls. I'm glad that you think that's so funny. <laughs> I've been having conversations with God, and I'm like, hey, we have a different sense of humor, God. So I need your prayers. There's seven women, including my wife, eight, right? And so help me, Jesus. Um, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, that man has three grandchildren? That is a sexy grandpa. Is that, is that what you're thinking? Not thinking that? Okay. All right, so um, that's what's happening in my family. Let me tell you what's happened with my church, okay? So I left five years ago, and I, I've been leading this church now, and this church was in very bad shape when I got there. Um, they, they had plummeted in giving, and attendance was really bad. Um, there was like 150 to 200 people that were holding on with bare, bare life, and the staff started all leaving, so I lost my kids pastor, my youth pastor, the discipleship guy. They're like all gone. And I'm like, wow, okay, Lord. And I'm like having this conversation with, with the Lord. Like, why did you send me to this church? It's in such bad shape. And I'll never forget this conversation that I had with my daughter, Montana. I was sitting in the living room and I was like, Montana, I think I blew it. I think I wasn't supposed to move here. And she said, well, dad, 
I have two things to say to you. Number one, I think you're not talking to God because God's telling me something completely different than you. And number two, you don't know my dad. And she just spoke life into her daddy and said, it's going to be great. And Pastor Jeff did the same thing because I called him and I was like, yeah, I'm an idiot. Can I have my job back? (laughs) You think I'm kidding. I'm not kidding. I did that. And he was like, Blake, God's going to do something bigger than you can ever dream or imagine. And so can I brag on God for just a little bit? We were $7.3 million in debt. And today we are debt free. And... And we had over 2,000 people attend for Easter this year. So God has just done an amazing work. Um, So who here believes that we serve a God of redemption and restoration? You guys believe that? So it's been a remarkable story. And I want to give him every ounce of the glory. But if I'm honest, I really had a hard time leaving Chase Oaks. And being with you is one of the greatest uh, joys of my life. And um, being back here is very uh, meaningful to me. And I, I just can't tell you how much I love you. And I really do miss you. Um, so God, God was wanting me to pivot, though. It was time for me to pivot. And that's what I want to talk about tonight, is learning how to pivot, pivot. And the name of my message is Circumstances That Shake and Shape Us. Okay? Touch your neighbor, and I want you to say this. Say, sometimes you got to pivot. Go ahead, say that. That was good. So this summer we are in a series and it's called Summer Snowball. And we've been talking about how to create momentum when it comes to like personal and spiritual growth. Transformation is always a process, right? And so there's these key catalysts that bring about change that happen in our life. And so this summer we've explored the idea of not getting stagnant and stale and stuck during the summer, but instead... To like be intentional and to, to take small practical steps so we'll grow in our relationship with God and in our faith. So let me start with the question. Is that all right? So here's my question. Who here is right now in the very middle of a pivotal circumstance and you're making like a gigantic life decision? Raise your hand. Oh, wow, there's a lot. Okay. There's some great big decisions being made here. And so I might ask you, you're in it right now. You're kind of like, what, do, what am I going to do? Well, when we're in moments like that, sometimes we're like, am I going to be um, shaped by this or am I going to be shaken by this? And sometimes I've seen it go both ways, right? Um, There's good things that happen where they're like having a baby. And it's like, this is awesome. It's a big decision. It's going to change everything. You don't know how much it's going to change you. Right, parents? Um, but, But we get ready for it. We start painting the wall. We buy the crib, Right. There's things like weddings that we prepare for, right? And we get all the flowers and all the venues and all those things. We prepare for this massive thing that's going to, we know is going to change the trajectory of your life. And then there's sometimes that things happen to you. uh, Things that shake us. Things like maybe um, you were married to someone and they were unfaithful. And then there was a sudden divorce. And now you're trying to figure out how to put the pieces back together. Uh, Maybe it was a job that you had and all of a sudden there was bad tension between you and the staff and then it was gone. Uh, Maybe for you, uh, somebody passed away and that shook you to your core and you can't make any sense of it. These things always have an opportunity to to shake us or opportunities to shake us, right? I've seen it go really bad where the the train is derailed and people are so shaken that they give up on life, they lose their faith, and they become angry and bitter. Have you ever seen that? But I've also seen that go the other way. And your faith is completely restored and all of a sudden you're like using that thing that happened as the catalyst to completely have a life change for the better. And it's like you, you pivoted your perspective you're like, well, that happened, but I'm not going down, right? Instead, I'm, I'm not going to give up on life. I'm, I'm actually going to chase after dreams and eventually become the person that I'm called to be. So I've seen, I've seen that happen as well. So moments that make you or break you, they, they shake you or they shape you. Are you guys tracking with me? Okay, so it kind of reminds me of the really sad story of a, of a gigantic company called Blockbuster. So this little company came along called Netflix. 
And they thought they were just a little punk. They actually laughed at them. Netflix came and said, we would like to buy you. In fact, we, we, we think that we should do a merger. And Blockbuster was like, yeah, no. Thank you, but no. And so it wasn't very long, though, that the writing was on the wall. And they realized, oh, wow, so um, streaming video is here to stay. And they lost it all. Why? Because they wouldn't pivot. And so when we look at the Word of God, we find all kinds of people throughout history that found themselves in pivotal moments and they're faced with massive life decisions, right? And they were trying to figure it out. They're grappling and they're in it and they're listening and trying to discern God's will and they're trying to be obedient and they're, they're doing their own faith journey, right? Well, that's just like us. It's not different. Those dudes were just like us. And so a lot of times we look at these people of the days of old and the heroes of our faith and we think, well, they, it was different for them. It's not. We, we still struggle the same way to know if we're in God's will or not. So I think of Abraham, the father of our faith. All he had, all he knew was, hey, go. And so he went. And so because of that, he, he listened to God and, and he was, through him, Israel was established as a nation. I think of Moses. Moses had a burning bush moment where he is before the Lord and God says, go. And so what did he do? He went. He goes to Pharaoh and then he crosses the Red Sea. He received the Ten Commandments and he set God's people free. I think of David, who's a humble shepherd boy, right? And then God says, go. And so he's actually anointed by Samuel to become a renowned warrior and he becomes Israel's greatest king. I'm struck by the fact that all of those dudes, they didn't know how big of a decision they were actually facing when they were in it. In the moment, they didn't know what God was doing. They were simply taking one small step. How many of you know that big moves always start with small steps? You guys know that? It reminds me of a Chinese proverb that says, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step step. So today I want to talk about an incredible account of a man who is standing in the way of God. He was literally standing against the movement of the early church. He was chasing after people. He's throwing him in prison. He's mocking anybody that's saved and following after Jesus. And people feared this dude. Um, But then Jesus himself literally stood in his path and told him, I need you to go another way. You've got to stop stepping on on my people. And you've got to go another way. So let's read Acts chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. It says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, Whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners of Jerusalem. Now Saul was actually operating with the authority of the high priest. And the dude, I mean, he thought he was doing the will of God, didn't he? After all, let me remind you of his, um, he he comes from good stock. This guy was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was actually trained by the great Rabbi Gamaliel himself. He was a brilliant theologian of the Torah, and now now there's this man that he sees as a threat to the teachings of, of Judaism. And so this man named Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth, was coming around and saying to people that he was actually the son of the Most High God. Um, he, he actually is called the Messiah. And so Paul is, is not having it. He's like, oh, uh-uh. He actually thinks of him, like most of the people there, that he was a liar, that he was a lunatic and a heretic. So Saul felt like it was his responsibility to eradicate this movement and anybody that belonged to the way. It doesn't matter if it was a man or a woman. And so what happens next is actually pivotal. It's probably the most dramatic conversion in church history. So let's watch Saul of Tarsus pivot, and then he becomes what? Paul the Apostle. So God turns this prideful and self-righteous tyrant into this powerful and passionate missionary. Verse 3. Here we go. You ready? 
As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood with their speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. So Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus, and for three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Now, I'm just going to say that if the creator of the world comes and stands in front of me in the form of a bright light, and he tells me that I am persecuting him, I think I would absolutely fall to the ground, terrified for my life, right? And so that's what he does. He's trembling. And it's fascinating that the only thing that Jesus asks is the question, why? Why, Saul? Why? Why are you persecuting me? He doesn't tell him these five steps of how to change and the steps of transformation. He, he simply asks, why? And then he says, okay, get up and go. And tonight I want to ask you, in the middle of your life decision, in the middle of your pivotal moments, or in the middle of a time when you're walking in rebellion and standing against God, what if Jesus himself stood before you in a bright light and just said, why? Why are you doing this? And so in Saul's defense, he does exactly what Jesus asked of him. He got up and he went. And I'm telling you, this man, he saw the adventure of a lifetime, didn't he? Because he went and he responded in faithfulness to go take the gospel of of Jesus to the Gentiles, he had three missionary journeys And he brought the truth of the gospel to the entire known world. He wrote 13 of the 27 books in the New Testament. And God used this pivotal moment in history to completely transform and shape this man into one of the most zealous and courageous men that the world has ever seen. Saul knew that after his Damascus Road experience, nothing could stay the same. And everything had to change. It changed his demeanor. It changed his friends. If you think about it, he probably no longer associated with being a Pharisee to uphold the Torah and the 600 Levitical laws. And so now he's like, I'm, my whole purpose is shifting. And so because of this, everything had to change. It had to be completely different. And so even his very name went from Saul to Paul. And it's partly because, I think that would affect me anyways, is is the fact that the man went blind. Have you ever thought about that? It's This is where I kind of sat all week in this study as I was studying this passage. I thought about the simple fact that God gave Paul a disability. Have you ever processed that? Like, that's jacked up. He, He, my man... Had, it says in the Bible he had to be led. He could no longer walk himself. He's running into walls. He's completely blind and, and he's left in the dark. And so for three days, we, he didn't know that it was going to be, you know, three days. For all he knew, he's blind for the rest of his life. And so let me say it like this. Sometimes God has to blind us to help us see. Can I get an amen? Sometimes God has to blind us to help us see. Let me say it another way. Sometimes God has to shake us so that he can shape us. It reminds me of Psalm 51 where it says, Create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. There's like this moldability that's happening in David's heart because he had sinned so horribly with Bathsheba and he's so broken, right? Sometimes it takes a shaking of doing something really awful for God to know that that's what it's going to take to make us moldable enough that he can shape us. I'm fixing to preach. Are you all right with that? 
Sometimes, though, in the middle of being shaped by God, I don't know about you, but for me, I'm, I'm left without answers. I feel like I'm sitting in the dark here, Lord. And sometimes all we have is questions. I don't know why Saul, how Saul was actually feeling during those three days, but those, those were the days that I promise you, he's grappling with what, what have I been in my life? And what do I need to become now? I can't go about my old friends. I can't hang in that crowd anymore. Everything's got to change. And so he, he had to decide of what he's going to do with this idea that now I actually believe that Yeshua was the Messiah. And, and because of that, I'm going to make him the Lord of my life. And I'm going to give the rest of my life to his teachings. It, it, it's in those moments that you realize God... You really are a potter and I'm the clay. And I need you to shape my heart and my mind and my thinking so that I can be shaped into your image. But man, being molded is painful. And it's like the burning away of the dross, right? It's the refining process. And in those moments, we might know that God loves us, but it doesn't feel like it. You're just in it and you're being shaped by the Father and we know that he has our best interest in mind, but you might go, I, I, feel like, I feel like you've betrayed me because I'm blind. You've allowed me to suffer and, and I feel alone and I feel like I'm hurting. And unfortunately, on this side of heaven, we don't know the full story, do we? We don't get to see the big picture. And so sometimes horrible things happen and we just we don't know why. We're just blind and all we have is Sometimes it's just silence and suffering. In April, I have a dear friend um, that was in a horrific car accident. It was at lunch, and he um, was just going to have some lunch with one of uh, a missionary that's in our church. And as he, was, he was, missionary was his best friend, and they were hit by a car head on, and the car caught on fire, and my friend Brian got out. But the car was burning and Woody was left in it. And Brian calls his wife and says, he calls Woody's wife and says, I think I killed your husband. I think I killed Woody. And sure enough, they life flighted him into Atlanta. And he died later that week. And this man, he was such a special man. Every Sunday, he would walk up to me and he'd say, Pastor Blake, that's your best sermon yet. It's the best one. And I always say, Woody, some of them suck. You say that every week. <laughs> and um, he was a really successful and influential man. He was VP of Citibank for years and years. And so he was this um, brilliant leader that always had incredible things to say. And, and in his later in life, he got this fire in his belly to want to tell people about Jesus. And so everywhere he went, he'd be like, man, you've got you to gotta come to our church. You've got to come. And so I can't tell you how many times I would walk up to somebody and they'd be like, yeah, I'm here because Woody invited me. It just seemed like I, I, our church grew like tremendously because of Woody. And so I was pretty upset with God. Like, why? Why did you, why did you allow Woody to go? Like, of all the people in my church, like, I really dig that guy. Not that I want, anyway, so, um, and so while I can't make sense of it, I, I want to tell you the rest of the story. Woody's son, Dan, has been running from God for a very long time, and he's lived a really rebellious life, and so after his dad died, he realized how much his father's faith had impacted him. And he actually placed his faith in Jesus. And he said, after church, this was three weeks ago. After church, I want you, you to come over to my house, Pastor. And I want you to baptize me in my pool. And he invites all of his family and friends. And so there was probably like, I don't know, 30 or 40 people that came. And after he was baptized, he comes up in tears. And he talks about his relationship with God now and how much Jesus means to him and why. And would you believe that 
one after another, after another, after another of his own family came down into the pool. And at the end of it, eight of his family were baptized. And so, yeah. Now, to make the statement that, that that's why Woody died, I, I don't know that. I'm, I'm not sovereign and in control of why people die. But it could have been. You know, maybe God was arranging it. And, and because of him being shaken, his son was shaped. And so maybe a God, our God is, is more involved in our Damascus Road experience than you re- really know. Sometimes we're sitting in our own sin and our own brokenness and we're left with our own pain and we're staring it in the face and maybe, maybe you're even standing against God and you're rebelling against Him and getting in the way of His will for our lives. It's in these pivotal moments that there's a crossroads of, of what to do. Will, will we continue in the same direction or will we get up and go another way? See, the word repentance, it means the act of changing one's mind. And true biblical repentance goes beyond just feeling bad about your sins, but it also involves pivoting and stepping back towards God. Nelson's Bible Dictionary says it just like that. Repentance is turning away from sin or rebellion and turning back to God. When I was in high school, I wanted to be a basketball player. But unfortunately, I am a short little fella. Did you mean to laugh that loud? I said I wanted to be a basketball She just, did you guys all hear that? Wow. So I, anyways, I'm a short little fella. And so one of the things that I learned in camp, though, the very first drill that we did was how to pivot, right? And so you would take the ball and you would turn and you'd, you'd spin and you could wait to see a pass and maybe even stop and shoot, right? And so you are pivoting. But the key to pivoting is that you have to be planted, don't you? And in our walk with God, it's similar. If you think about like when you first wake up in the morning, what if you realize the first thing I've got to do is got to get planted and I'm going to pivot so that I can turn my face towards God. And then all of a sudden your, your day is going to be completely different because you've changed your perspective of what this day is going to look like, right? And so I just want to say to you that sometimes this world is really broken and it's filled with despair. But I want to remind you of something that we can know God's will for our lives. And maybe you're like, what, what is that? Thank you. I would love to hear that, Blake. Well, it's really simple. It's not hard. It's to love God and to love his people to know God and to make Him known. And so God gives us this big umbrella of His will, um, umbrella of His will to carry out day-to-day thoughts and decisions. And as long as we're knowing God intimately, vertically, and making Him known horizontally, you're probably in God's will. And I think that's, I think that's the only reason that we're here, right? And so it's, it's all about perspective. Are you turning your face towards God as you're loving your family and running your business? Are you turning your face towards God as you're living the life that God's given you? See, because all of life is this battle between sweet and bitter. It's this constant feeling of pleasure and pain. There's, there's joy and at the same time there's misery. There's moments that shake us. And then at the same time, we're also being shaped. And every day we have this choice to focus on the pain and the death of this world. Or we can turn our face towards the goodness of our Father who is currently in the process of making all things new and beautiful. Do you guys believe that? It's all about perspective. And so there's probably nobody that taught me more about that than my own dad. In March, my father passed away. And it was definitely, for me, a very pivotal moment. 
I heard God so loud during that season. And one of the things that I love the most about my dad is that even while he was on his deathbed, you couldn't get the man to stop worshiping God. He would just like say words over and over and over. Of some, if he wasn't singing, he was quoting old songs. And the one that he said the most was, he'd always just sit there in his bed as he's dying. And he'd say, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he's living no matter what men say. I see his hand of mercy and I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. And right then, I captured him singing, He Lives, in the last moments of his life. And I'd like to share it with you. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. So my dad's with Jesus right now. He made the ultimate pivot. But here's what I know. I know that I'm going to see him again. And I also know that in the meantime, I have a job to do. We've got work to get done down here, right? And so to honor my dad and to honor my heavenly father, something my father would say all the time is, if I'm not dead, then God's not done. And so some of you came here today going, I don't don't know that God has a plan for me. I don't know if I have a purpose in this life. And some of you might be overwhelmed by horrible decisions that you've made. And the pain of your past sins are really heavy. And you feel broken. And maybe, maybe you're ashamed of the life that you've lived. Maybe, maybe you're being really mean to yourself. You're always talking bad about yourself and you're walking in self-hatred can I just tell you to stop that that's exactly what the enemy of darkness wants to do this isn't hard all you have to do is repent change the way you think and pivot turn back to God I don't want you to lose everything that you have like blockbuster just because you weren't willing to pivot can I tell you something today I know that I know that I know that you don't have to live in bondage anymore. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. And tonight, you can choose to be free. But you have to be willing to pivot. I I want every one of you to understand the freedom that I'm talking about. Because I've experienced it myself. And in an instant, God can restore your identity and make you into a brand new creation. Do you know that the Bible tells us that when we accept Christ as our Savior and believe in Him, then we're actually saved. And He becomes our Savior. And then we receive from Him a priceless inheritance. He makes you His sons and daughters. And He sits you at the table. And then He freely offers you everlasting life. In 1 Peter chapter 1 it says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's by His great mercy that we have been born again. Because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And now we live with what? Great expectation. And we have a priceless inheritance. An inheritance that's kept in heaven for you right now. And it's pure. And it's undefiled. And it's beyond the reach of change and decay. So, Chase Oaks, let's place hope in the only firm foundation that's ever been here and that's Christ Jesus Christ alone gives hope and his hope is actually a living hope and his hope is eternal and it will not fade it stands the test of time does anybody here believe that Jesus Christ is worthy of our praise in in his in his great mercy he took our old life and he restored and redeemed it and he gave us a new life and now now we have a reason to wake up to pivot our face towards him and say I'm going to attack the day with great expectation 
He gave us a spiritual inheritance that turned us into His kids. Our Father God loves us. Don't you realize that Jesus made the ultimate pivot when He chose to die so we could have eternal life? He left heaven where he was being worshipped by the angels, sitting at the right hand of God. And he came down here into our filth and he gave his life as a ransom for our sins. And because of that, we now know that our eternal inheritance is secure. It's written in blood. It's kept in heaven for me and for you right now. It will never perish, spoil, or fade. So let's boldly walk in the power of the Spirit. This world can't shake us. We're followers of Jesus. We don't walk around in despair or defeat. This world can't touch us. Nobody knows how bad it's been other than Jesus Himself. And there's no matter how bad it gets for us, no matter what horrible circumstances come our way, we walk by faith, not by sight. Church, we win this thing, right? So let's live as victorious children of the Most High God because He defeated hell and the grave. And today, we go before Him worshiping the King Jesus because our, He's our firm foundation and worthy of our praise. Come on, church. So, with that, I just want us to end this in worship tonight. So let's pray. Father God, we just thank you that we can come before you and we know that we know that sometimes this world is awful. Sin is all around us. There's darkness. Sometimes we create our own darkness and we're blinded. We can't see that we're living for the wrong things. We're placing our hope on the wrong foundation. It's not going to last. And so today, Lord, we just want to place our faith and our hope in you. Jesus, you came and died on the cross for us. And because of that, we have eternal life. So, Father, we we repent of the days that we walk around in timidity. I pray we'd walk in boldness and with authority on this earth. Just like Paul, who was radically changed. and He was so different after he had this encounter with you. And I know many people in this room and online have experienced a similar encounter where you you really changed them. So, Father, today we, we realize that some things can't be the same. Because of your change in us, we we can't operate with the old operating system. There's a whole new creation, a whole new life that you've given us. And so, Father, may we walk in the power of your Holy Spirit. May we be hungry for the Word of God. And may we please you and do your will and be obedient. When you say to go, God, we will go. We'll be faithful and true. Lord Jesus, we give you our lives. We love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing Firm Foundation.